Writers' Festival 2021. It's really lovely to be back in a room with a live audience of crime lovers. Welcome also to those of us joining on Zoom, including people throughout New South Wales who are watching from their local library or from their homes, courtesy of their local libraries. My name's Nicole Aberty. I'm delighted to welcome you here to the Metcalf Auditorium for this conversation with much-loved Australian writer Robert Drew about Close Encounters with a Murderer. Fascinating title, and it's going to be a really fascinating discussion with Robert, I absolutely know. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respect to the elders past and present. A few short admin announcements before we start. As you will have already seen, we're very carefully following COVID protocols. Everyone here is double vaxxed. We've all checked in with our QR codes and everyone should keep their masks on except when they're eating or drinking or in our case, up on stage talking. Social distancing means there are restricted numbers in this room. Hand sanitizer is available if you need it and please let a volunteer know if you're feeling unwell. Please mute your mobile phones and don't record the session. And if you're taking photos, please don't use your flash. Feel free to share on social media um, at Bad Crime Sydney or hashtag Bad Crime Sydney. We've got about 10 minutes for questions at the end after our conversation. If you're joining us on Zoom, please send your questions through using the chat function about 20 minutes before the end of the session and we'll do our best to include them. Let me then introduce you to Robert Drew, though oldest cliche in the book, he doesn't need an introduction at all, but let me tell you a little bit about him to refresh your memories. Robert started his working life as a cub reporter at the age of 18 for the West Australian newspaper. In his late twenties, he left full-time journalism to write and his first book, The Savage Crows was published in 1976. He has continued to work as a journalist whilst writing full-time, writing for many publications, including The Australian, where he was literary editor, The Bulletin and The Sydney Morning Herald. He's written seven novels, including The Drowner, which won the Premier's Literary Prize in every state and was voted one of the 10 best international novels of the decade. He's also written short stories, memoirs and plays and has won numerous literary awards and received many, many accolades here and abroad. His recent short story collection, The True Colour of the Sea, won the 2019 Colin Roderick Literary Award, and this year he won the very prestigious Copyright Agency's Cultural Funds Authors Fellowship. Our conversation today about Close Encounters with a Murderer will draw on his award-winning memoir, The Sharknet, which was published by Penguin in 2000. Let me tell you a bit about The Sharknet. It won the 2000 Western Australian Premier's Prize for Nonfiction, and the 2000 Brisbane Courier Mail Award of the Year, Book of the Year Award. It was described by the New York Times as superb, wonderful and macabre, macabre. And it was adapted for an ABC and BBC TV miniseries. Robert's gonna tell us a little bit about that later and a BBC radio drama. Welcome Robert to the Bad Crime Writers Festival. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, wait, he doesn't know how to do it. Thank you very much. We'll add that to your skill set now. Robert, I'm going to ask you to start by telling us what is the shark net about? Um, the shark net is, in uh, one sense, a memoir of growing up at a particular time in suburban Western Australia. Um, but it's a time that also coincides with um, the evil reign of. Um, a man who I knew, who killed a boy I knew, and at least another seven people um, over a period of about um, seven, six or seven years. He killed them um, by so many different means that the police were stymied and thought they were looking for, for eight different uh, perpetrators. Let's start. We're not going to go through all of them. There were, as you say, eight murders that he was ultimately uh, committed and I think it were 14 murder attempts. Let's start by talking a little bit about the first two murders which took place I think in 1959 when you were I imagine a fairly impressionable 16 year old. Tell us a bit about those first two. Well, everyone he killed <clears throat> um, was a stranger and most of them were asleep so he was a prowler who, who began he was he was a classic small-time criminal, the sort of guy who stole women's underwear from clotheslines 
and rifled through um, dressing tables, that sort of thing. Uh, but the first woman, he, the first person he killed was a woman, Patricia Berkman, who woke while he was rifling through um, her belongings. And so he, he had a fisherman's knife on him. And so he stabbed her to death. Now, from that moment on, um, his forays and prowling uh, obviously sparked something different in him. And then on, he usually killed the people he was prowling, the, the people's homes who he was prowling. He, he genuinely went that step further. And that woman, the way it was reported was quite sensationalist, wasn't it? She was described as the naked divorcee. Yes, well, she was a divorcee, which in those days was like saying, uh, especially in the tabloid press, was like saying, this woman is a prostitute, basically. Mm. Um, and she worked as a sales assistant at David Jones in Perth, which, you know, well, that's a bit dodgy too. Um, <laughs> and, she had, and she had a Greek boyfriend, which really was the, the triumvirate. Um, so the papers went to town on her, as well as the unknown uh, killer. And then the next person murdered was Gillian Brewer, 22-year-old heiress. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Murder? Yes, she was the heiress of the, I don't know whether any of you remember McRobertson's Chocolates, which were very big. They made the snack bar and various other things. Anyway, she, she was uh, the heiress to that McRobertson's fortune, living in an apartment in Cottesloe in WA. And um, she was um, asleep. Her boyfriend had just left. Uh, they'd been... They'd, they'd, made love and been together all evening. He'd left. Um, Cook had watched them um, through a window. The boyfriend left. He then went in there when she was asleep and hit her with a, a hatchet, hit her with a tomahawk and a pair of, and stabbed her with a pair of scissors. And there wasn't much left of her when he finished. Um, and I don't know whether this is jumping into your, into one of your another one of your questions, but the, uh, in, in terms of, my sort of connection with this. The, the, that was my next question. Tell us. You, the the yeah. tomahawk was, was owned um, by the family of, of a friend of mine, my best friend at the time, who had been using the tomahawk to trim the edges of the path of grass and weeds and things that afternoon and hadn't put it away. Being a teenage boy, hadn't put it away. And so he lived right near the woman he that was murdered. He lived behind that block of flats, yeah. So the murderer had picked that up on the way through. Yeah, and then killed Gillian Brewer with it. But Simon, my friend's fingerprints were on it as well. How did he feel about that? Well, like everyone else, he was well even more. So he was he was devastated, like a lot of people. But there were Perth being a small community at the time, and uh, the western suburbs being um, intensely involved in each other's lives in that middle class, reasonably well off way. Um, everyone had some sort of connection with a victim, really. The next three murders, so this was 1959, those two, and then the next three murders all took place around the same time at 2am in the morning on a Sunday after Australia Day 1963. You were 20 by this stage. I'm going to, just before we get to those, just tell us what you what was your job at this stage? Where were you working? I was a cadet reporter on the West Australian, <clears throat> um, covering just about everything, but mostly the minor courts, the Perth Police Court, which was the Magistrates Court, where you were, um, it, the courts dealt with, with small offences and it was also where you were committed um, to the larger courts if you, had, if you were um, accused of a, a serious crime. So with this one, it started out, didn't it? it? He had a, it started out with him spying on a couple basically who were parked in a car and he was spying on them and, and sort of generally disturbing. And then I think, some one of them threw a bottle at him and that provoked him and then what happened uh, the, the man in the car who, who was who, who was sort of canoodling with a barmaid in the in the car and they didn't like the idea of a peeping tom looking at them annoyed the man he threw a beer bottle at the at the um, prowler who then had a rifle on him and shot them but he did, but he only wounded them and they drove off at speed to, uh, to Fremantle Hospital, but the prowler was then um, enraged enough to sort of keep going with the mood he was in, mm -hmm. and he climbed into a block of flats and shot a, a young lifesaver who was asleep. Um, Sleep in his bed? In his bed, yeah. And shot him in? Shot him in the head. Yeah. Um, and then travelled in, in a car to, to Netherlands, um, about three kilometres away, um, where he prowled around the back of several houses 
and shot, uh, again, a sleeping um, boy who, who was a friend of mine, who was a uni student uh, living in the house of a, a sort of semi-boarding house for students near, near the University of WA. And he happened to be sleeping on the veranda outside and that's it where was, he it was It was hot. Shot. It was a heat wave. And he and he and another friend of mine, Scott McWilliam, and had a um, tossed a coin to see who got the advantage of sleeping on the back veranda in the cool. And John, my friend, uh, won and was asleep as the killer came through and at very close quarters shot him in the head. And they just, Scott and John, hadn't they had had like... And it's just so poignant the way you describe this in your book that they, um, they'd had a little chat shortly before. Like I think someone had got up in the night to go to the bus and they found out they were both awake. So that Scott had been out there with him. They'd been chatting. Scott had gone back to bed. And then how did he learn about the murder? Well, next, next morning they found out about it. But after, the, after shooting John, the killer then went, uh, walked to the next street with a rifle, rang the doorbell of a, of a, a middle-aged couple called Wamsley, and when the sleepy um, house owner came to the door, he, he shot him in the head um, and he died too. So that was three in that night. Um, and that was that. But from that moment on, Perth was alert and worried and the whole, the whole um, atmosphere of the town changed. So I want to ask you, and I should, maybe I should have started by this, you'd lived in Perth from when you were six. You'd moved as a child. Your family had moved from Melbourne to Perth yep. and you'd lived there from the age of six and lived a pretty happy, carefree kind of life there. Sure. From your observations, what was, what was Perth like up until these murders? What kind of a city was it? What kind of a lifestyle was it? Sleepy. Um, it was it was a sleepy conservative um, Huckleberry Finnish sort of childhood. Um, people because it was hot. People there was a habit of people would sleep on their front verandas. They'd pull the mattress out onto the front veranda or the back veranda or onto the lawn. You said people didn't lock doors. You said no, 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 no. They didn't lock doors, and it was regarded as a sign of of, of suspicion and mistrust if you didn't leave your keys in the ignition of the car too. So when, when, when the killer was wandering around in, in other people's cars, he never had to um, hotwire them or anything like that. He just would find one with the keys still in the ignition. And back doors were open, front doors yep. were open, windows weren't locked. Yeah, blocks of, he'd climb in through um, bathroom windows in blocks of flats. Or he, didn't, he never had to actually break and enter. Um, he just entered. And then how did, after the, these terrible, particularly these three Australia Day murders, how did that change people were really terrified weren't they and how did the how did Perth change how did the way people behave change um well every, every no one knew what was going on everyone mistrusted um everyone else really in a way um the police were of no help whatsoever they were looking as I said for eight different people and the police commissioner himself said this isn't the same person yeah, that, because his modus, the modus operandi was different. In, and then, and then there, we, we won't go through all of them, but after these, there are a couple more murders. Somebody, a woman is run down in the street, somebody else is strangled. So is it because his modus operandi in each case was different? Police didn't think they were looking for a serial killer. They thought they were looking that's for right. a bunch of killers. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And Quite you right. write in the book just about little things that really struck me, the details, like people started buying guard dogs um, locksmiths started to get busy. Would you like to talk a little bit about that, about how people's own daily life habits changed? Did your family change their habits? Um, well, we changed our habits in all sorts of ways. One way was, which we were like every other male over 14, we were, susp we were suspects. Mm. So um, we were, my father and I were fingerprinted twice, mm. um, as were every other male over 14. In, how did that feel? Well, well if you're 14 year old, it was quite exciting. <laughs> but it, but it was um, we knew we hadn't done it as well, <clears throat> um, so it was sort of inter it was interesting and but a bit you know creepy, um, but that that was the tenor of the times. You you just expected there to be more bizarre behaviour really by, on the the part of the authorities, and all the there were. Uh, well, they, they had the hat, they'd found, they had found the hatchet and they were still wondering who did that, whether it was my friend Simon or someone else. Um, and they'd found the scissors and they'd, they'd found the, the, the uh, fishing knife for the other murders, um, but they didn't have the rifle. 
they, let's just go back a step for that that second murder. They then did find, didn't they, and charge somebody with that murder, and they think they thought they'd found the the person. Um, yes, they they they. I mean, this is this is grotesque in a way, but they were always looking for someone who wasn't quite right, and obviously the killer wasn't wasn't quite right. But there was a a deaf mute called Daryl Beamish, who. Um, had had in the extreme way of these farcical coincidences had also prowled Gillian Brewer's house that night. So he was charged. He was he? charged with murder and sentenced to death. Yeah, and he did. He did. The sentence was commuted, wasn't it? But he did. Well, he cool, did well eventually, when the killer was the killer was found, we'll get to that. Confessed. Yeah. Yeah. Confessed. But the police had... didn't believe that no, he no, did no. that. No, no, no. They still thought that the young deaf mute, mute boy had done it. And so he served. Yeah, a lot, a lot of police, especially in those days, and especially in that place, didn't want to admit they were wrong. So they would rather have someone been, been executed than, than, than say they stuffed up. Robert, I want to take you back to your personal experiences after these three, I'm calling them the Australia Day murders, these three consecutive murders. You say in, in your book that for a week afterwards, you. You just sort of had this fascination. You were drawn to drive back past the victims' houses every day. And you said, I knew it was macabre, but I couldn't help it. I was compelled. Why do you think that was? What were your feelings? What was it that dro drove you to drive back? Because I was a young reporter and I was half, part of the time on police rounds, part of the time doing courts. I would, um, and my girlfriend lived across the river. I, and I would borrow my mother's old Renault car and on the way either to my girlfriend's house or home, I would drive past the Berkman house, which was in South Perth too, mm. um, just to see if there was anything that, I don't know, stood out, anything that made the it. clues. Sense. Were you looking for clues? Was that part of it? I, don't, I was just looking for at, some sort of atmosphere, I suppose. Maybe this was just the very, very early signs of the, the novelist rather than the reporter. Mm. I, who, I don't know. Um, but they were <clears throat> they, they were strange times, and it was only um, an accident that the police um, were able to find the killer in the end as well. We'll come to that in a moment. The other thing that you talked about was you said there was this very eerie feeling through the whole town, on the beaches, in the pubs, in the beer gardens. I mean, people must have been just terrified to go out. Yeah, exactly. And I was at that stage working in a... Uh, uh, a, a very late shift at the at the newspaper, um, starting at starting at midnight till eight a.m. So driving through town um, in my mother's Renault, um, buses buses in Perth stopped at about 10, 10 p.m. and the lights went off all over the at one p.m. at one a.m. Um, so it was dark and and creepy driving driving to work or driving around on my rounds was a pretty eerie. Uh, experience for a few months and it you write about in the book how the fact that one of the victims you actually knew he was a young man your own age and for a lot of you all of you realized that it it, it could have been any of you that you know sleeping in yeah, this, well, this was, this was I mean, john sturkey who was sleeping on the, the yeah. Back, back veranda yeah and you say in the book that the more that thinking about it and your own personal feeling it gave you a terrible conflicted guilty thrill tell us about that feeling it was very, um, well, it was a mixture of all sorts of things. I, sadness and, the, uh, of course, and shock, um, but also the feeling of him having won, won the sort of little personal lottery of winning the... the, the uh, minutes of the, Yeah, the, um, the cooler bed on the, on oh, the nice. veranda thing was, was really extraordinary. And also... The, the hand of fate. The, yes, and also because he was only going to be there for another couple of weeks, he'd won a scholarship... You, you couldn't study agriculture in those days at the University of WA. You had to come. <clears throat> you had to come east. And he was about to. He'd won a scholarship um, to a bigger, better, brighter, more sophisticated place. And he was about to leave um, for that bigger adventure, too. Police did. I think I've mentioned that it was only a couple of weeks after those Australia Day murders that two more young women were violently killed. One was run down by a car, one was strangled. In September 1963, 
the police eventually captured the killer. Tell us about how that came about. How did they, how did they catch him eventually? Well, he, he had just shot um, a, a young babysitter, an 18-year-old babysitter called Shirley MacLeod, a block away from my parents' house. And um, this was a, another, during the, the stage of our second fingerprint, my father's and my second fingerprinting, because the, the um, man who owned the house was a neighbour of, da of Dad's, and Dad had been around to their place having beers on the Sunday before. And his fingerprints were there, like other, like I mean, my father's finger, actual fingerprints were in the, were in the house. Um, so that, that was another, you know, sort of personal um, complication. But, um, and that was the same rifle that had been used um, to kill John and Wamsley and Brian Weir. So um, the police um, accidentally had were uh, it was reported to them an old couple walking across the river in Mount Pleasant going for a, a stroll saw a rifle hidden in a bush and told the cops who who watched the rifle in the bush for two weeks they camped nearby it's a bit of fishing line involved they tied it they tied it to the to the tree and uh, on the next full moon, as it happened, I don't know whether people believe in that full moon theory of, of maniacs and vampires and things, but on the next full moon, he, the, the killer came to try and get the rifle. So they, they pounced. And then he said, yes, I did it. We're going to talk more about his response because it was very odd. But I want to just focus on you for the moment. The murderer turned out to be somebody you knew, a man called Eric Cook. How did you know him? Uh, he worked for my father. My father was the um, the branch manager, the state manager of Dunlop in WA, and Eric was a, a, one of his truck drivers. Mm -hmm. And he would come to our house about three times a week, driving one of those big yellow and black Dunlop trucks, delivering things and taking them away and so forth. And one, the first time I met him, I was uh, I was thirteen then, much earlier than this, and I was mending um, mending a puncture in my bike tire in the days when people did things like that. Um, and, and I was boredly waiting for the, um, the cement, rubber cement to set. And this guy came up behind me and said that you'll get, and I was pumping the bike pump on my arm. So it made a, a farting sort of noise on skin, just out of sheer teenage boredom. And- um, <laughs> Hold the microphone up, please. <laughs> Hold the microphone up. Yeah. And, and the, um, this, this small, a uh, dark-haired guy um, with a speech impediment said to me, you'll get warts doing that. And I thought, hmm. Um, and, but it sounded as if he said something. It sounded as, as if he said, there's a horse doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not mocking people with impediments, but I thought, what the Christ, what's he, what's he getting at? Um, so um, I looked up and anyway, he then started chatting and things. Um, and, he, and, and in those days, I was 13 and pink shirts were very popular in the, the and tight jeans and desert boots were very popular in the, the set that I moved in. And, um, and he said, what's with it? Are you a commo or something? Because <laughs> you were wearing a pink shirt. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, and I said, I don't know what's a commo. Um, no, I'm not. Anyway, we started talking. And from then on, as he would come to our house, he realised that I liked and played hockey. And he liked and played hockey and was actually very good at it. He played A-grade a hockey. And so we'd have a few hits and he, and he, would, he, and he would run rings around the 30-year-old boy. Um, so, and he'd come to our place about three times a week. And if I was out in the backyard hitting the ball against the fence or something, he would, um, he would do it too. Over how, so that you were 13 then and these first murders occurred when you were 16. So uh, over all that period, would you say that often, that many times a week? Was it um, frequent? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't always be there. But, but I mean, he, he came three times a week, you know, and perhaps one of those once a week, I probably saw him for three years at, or, or once or twice. And he was a family man, wasn't he, Robert? Tell us about his family. He had, he had seven kids. He was only in his 30s. Yeah, yeah. He, he had seven kids, and um, are we mentioning his name and things? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and his name was Eric Edgar Cook, 
and he was married to um, a, a woman called Sally. And the, of the seven kids, um, and I would later meet and interview Sally and his second eldest son, Tony, they'd had a litany of genetic misfortune in their lives. Um, one, of the, one of the children was a thalidomide child. Um, and one, the eldest one was badly mentally um, uh, disturbed. The thalidomide one had no arm, right? The little Just girl had, had no arm. A little finger coming out of the arm. And, and a couple of others weren't, um, you know, in the best of shape. Um, and he himself had a, had a hair, hair lip and a cleft palate. So when you found out that it was him, and it was somebody that you knew that had been a regular visitor to your house, you played sport with, worked for your dad. How did you, well, how did you feel and were you surprised? Well, I, I only knew about it when, of course, he was found and, and convicted and, and charged. Okay. So tell us about no that. Inkling, of course, until then. Okay. So tell us then, you were at the, the, so there's the committal proceedings, first of all, to commit someone for trial, and then he's tried for murder. And you were at both the committal proceedings and the trial. Let's yep. start with the committal proceedings. So tell, tell us about those. You were present at those. I'm, I'm outside the court on that Ashfield area between the court, the court and the... Um, and the where the Black Mariah would bring the prisoners in from Fremantle Prison to the court, and the the, the Black Mariah doors opens, and he and this little man, because he was small, is brought out with uh, with heavy detectives all around him, and shuffled into the into the um, cells beneath the court, and then later is in the dock, um, where over a period of days they charged him. Um, well, he was charged with all the with all the murders, but the one he was appearing in court for was the the uh, charge of killing John Sturkey, my friend. Um, and seeing, and I'm sitting in the press table, and seeing Adelaide right in front of me as 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 close as I am to um, you know the steps there, um, are all the clinical, very black and white, ten by eight police photographs of John's head and body and the surroundings and the bed and everything. Um, and there's and there's Eric in the in the in the court. And towards the afternoon, the sun's coming in through the, the high court windows. And I'd been avoiding looking looking at him and was sort of able to, just because of the way people were moving around the court and where people were positioned and so forth. Um, but there was a stage in the afternoon when the sun's rays were just so that when he looked towards me, I couldn't look away and I looked at him and he winked at me and I, and I winked back. And I, in that instant, I had that, I was in that strange, felt that strange feeling of, I felt like some sort of treacherous criminal. But I also thought, and this is a split second decision, if I don't acknowledge someone that has shown, made a friendly gesture towards me, what sort of a shithead am I? Um, but then you I felt, felt guilty. But you then I felt, felt instantly, guilty. instantly guilty of of being a, the worst sort of person possible. So were you surprised all those complex that complex thoughts happen much, much quicker than that? Yeah. Were you surprised that it was him? Well, that he'd been charged with the murders. He, he, he was committed for trial, obviously. Well, well, yes, of course I was surprised because you don't expect anyone you know to be charged with murder, with the murder of someone you also know, um, when they didn't know each other. I knew mm. both of them and they didn't know each other. They had no idea who each other were. Um, but I must say that Eric, when, when he looked at him in a dispassionate way, he looked like a comic book criminal. Mm. He looked like the, a criminal in the Dick Tracy comics that I used to love. Uh, as a kid, uh, um, he was small and swarthy and he frowned and he had a misshapen face and he had an old fashioned um, dark blue pinstriped suit with wide lapels. And when you're a teenager, you clothes are more important than they are when you're eight or nine. And he looked, he looked like a crook then. And Robert, one of the amazing things that you write about, and I, I should say, if you fascinated by this story as of course I became after reading this book 
you can Google Eric Cook, C double OK, and you can see photos of him and it, and it gives you a real sense of it. Um, and there's been quite a lot written about him. But one of the extraordinary things was he confessed in such detail, didn't he? It was almost as if he was proud to tell the story. Yes. Tell us a bit about that. He, he was proud. He was finally, um, he finally felt he was someone. And when I delved into his family his history later when, from when writing the book, he had a terrible childhood. When he was born with an obvious deformity, his father said to his mother, don't think I'm going to have anything to do with bird mouth. Um, he was expelled from his first school when he was five, at primary school. Uh, the kids teased him all his life. Um, he was, he was a, a loser right from the, the word go. And when I was writing about him uh, and having known him, um, there was no one could have been more, had committed more heinous crimes, but there was a certain manic thing there, I, I thought, as a, as a lay person. There was nothing in it for him um, other than perhaps thinking, as he said, as his lawyer tried to say at his trial, um, thinking he was God. Um, he talked about the power too, didn't he? He did it for the power. Yeah. And he was obviously someone that hadn't had much power in his life. No. But he had been, I mean, he had been also, um, uh, some of that was also a little bit fishy in that he had been a thief, he'd been a, he'd been a prowler, um, he'd hurt a lot of other people. Committed arson at 14? He committed arson, set fire to a department store at 14. Um, so he had, he had, uh, he had form, <laughs> yes. Um, so you were present at the, so he's committed for trial and then you are present at the trial. And as you say, he wasn't tried for all of the eight murders. He was just tried for the one, John Sturkey's. What was it like? What happened at the trial? Well, the, 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 the whole trial was fishy and it was, it was for all sorts of reasons, it didn't ring really true. The whole state hated him and was scared of him for a start. Um, they, 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 you couldn't have found an impartial um, jury person in the, in the whole state of West Australia. Um, in the in the dock, you had evil Eric Cook. On the bench, you had the judge whose name was Mr. Justice Virtue. I mean, you, you couldn't script that. You couldn't make you couldn't make the people to give us a break. If you yeah. if a fiction writer wrote that, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so you had Justice virtue, virtue against you had virtue <laughs> against evil. Um, when he when his um, when, when Cook's um, uh, defence counsel tried to get uh, an independent psychiatric um, uh, appraisal of him, the Crown would only give him the Crown psychiatrist, who was also giving evidence for the Crown. Now, that's kangaroo court stuff. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, the Crown psychiatrist came down on the side of the Crown's Decisions, and said right? not he wasn't insane he was sane because that was his that was his only defense he confessed so yep. the only defense he could have was, was insanity. insanity yeah so the jury only retired for a very short time didn't they mm -hmm. they barely and the door wasn't barely shut yeah barely an hour which you, i think you say in the book is like the minimum time yep. for it to be respectable and then they came back in yep. they delivered the guilty verdict what did the judge do um well he put on these are the days when they put on that little black um crown thing on the on the head and sentenced him to death and i was watching um all this with in in, in a gog and but the expression on eric's face as he was sentenced to death and he was found guilty was almost as if um it was sort of beatific as if as if um you know i'm i've made it he said it was almost like he was grateful yeah, yeah, it, it was very, very, very strange. And life then went on. I mean, he was in in um, in prison in in solitary and then death row for quite a while, during which time his wife visited him every day while the kids played in the park nearby. And while he was in jail, his eldest son, the one who was um, mentally disturbed, who was in care, wandered into the Swan River and drowned. So you had his poor wife, she's got seven kids, her husband's on death row, her eldest son's just wandered into the river and drowned, and there's only one other, sorry, two other of the seven who, who are the full quid. 
um, you know, I, my, you know, there's almost too much mm. as someone following them to to bear. It was like a great great tragedy or something. And he ultimately he was executed a, a year later in October '64. The last man in Perth, person in Perth to be executed, the second last in Australia. After the trial, you went and spoke to Sally. You found out a little bit of information. They'd married in 1953. She was 19. He was 22. And so I, when I did the maths on that, he committed his first murder six years later into the marriage. He's only been married for six years. He was 28. He commits the first of these horrendous murders. You went to speak to her. I was wondering why you did that. Was that for the purpose of writing this book? Was that was it w when you decided to write the book that you then went to speak to her and, and also to one of his sons? Partly, partly, obviously. Um, but I was also very curious as someone who had been connected in a small way to, to him and to and to, to a larger way to um, John, the, the victim. But I wanted to find out what sort of really what sort of a background he came from. And one of the things he used to do, he was always, um, he was always a show off. Um, he, he always wanted to big note himself in a way that was sort of crazy. He would try and, he, there was a, a ballroom in, in Perth uh, called the Embassy Ballroom in those days um, in William Street, Perth, um, about a hundred metres from the river. And he would try and um, he'd ask girls to dance and things, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't. Um, he was short and not pleasant to look at, and they would laugh and titter and move, doing girl things and not dance with him. Mm. And at the end of it, end of the dance, he would run out of the dance hall, fully clothed in the sports coat and clothes of the you know dancing clothes of the day. And run down the hill, down to the, to the William Street jetty, and dive into the river. This is at midnight, fully clothed, and swim out, swim out across the river, leaving people, leaving the smart middle class girls and behind, but to their gasps and um, surpri of surprise. Um, and and he'd, 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 you know, it was a form of extreme showing off. When you spoke to Sally, his wife, you asked her what kind of a husband he was. So they had seven young children. What did she tell you? What was he like as a husband and father? Um, not, not good. Um, she always suspected him of infidelity. She didn't suspect him of murder or anything. And she was a very honest, she was a 10 pound pom um, who was very grateful to be, they, they'd met working at the Perth markets. And um, and she'd had seven children quite quite quickly. Um, she always suspected of infidelity, but she also wondered why he wouldn't let them, when he went to work each day, and he had from job to job to job, in the days of full employment, he'd get, he'd get the sack from one job, like when my father sacked him for theft, um, he, uh, he would just move on, he'd get another job straight away. Um, she... Um, he would bring he would bring things home that she wonder why like things possessions that were obviously taken from uh, women's um, dressing tables and that sort of stuff, but he'd keep them all in the in the sort of attic. Um, so she wondered why there was all and she was pretty innocent, I must say. And she, as you say, she she certainly said that she thought he was unfaithful, and she seemed to have pretty good reasons for believing that. But she said it had never occurred to her that he no, was not, not in a, a million, killer, let alone be killer. Not in a million years. No. And what about, you spoke to Tony, his second son, who was eight when his dad was arrested, and you talked to him. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that conversation? Yes, yeah, Tony ended up being, um, and he, he died only recently, but he, he ended up being um, the head of the, the West Australian um, Trades and Labor Council. He, got, he had a university degree, he later became an economics teacher. Wow. He was a success story of, wow. the, of it. Um, I asked, well, first of all, I asked Sally how, to, because this was something that I've been very curious about. L let me just explain something else. When, when I was, used to be waiting for my bus to school of a morning, West Australia used to hang people quite um, regularly on a Monday morning at 8 a.m. Um, in the days of, of, they were the last state to stop ex executions. 
um, and I'd be waiting for my bus and there'd be the, um, the newspaper, um, out, newspaper thing out the standards out the front saying man to hang at 8am or, you know, uh, and so forth with a picture of a, you know, a strange looking guy. And as the bus arrived, I'd be counting down the minutes, like you know, five to eight, six, seven, five, 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 five. then I'd think, bang, you know, and then as an eight-year-old, um, that used to affect me. And um, so I was curious about what it would feel like. And years later, I asked these questions to Sally and the son, Tony, not, you know, shortly after, years, years later. And I said, what did it feel like at about 10 to eight uh, on that particular Monday morning when you know that uh, Eric, your husband, is about to be hanged, what were you doing? You know, what, how were you coping? And she said, well, dear, it's funny, what with, she had a lot of kids, what with getting the kids ready for school and cutting the sandwiches and things. Next time I looked at the clock, it was 20 past eight. What about the son? There was something that he said as well. Well, I asked Tony. I asked it was Tony, eight? I, said, I asked Tony, I said, what was it like? You know, this must have been terrible, Tony. What, you know, how did you... If you don't mind me asking the question, what, what was it like that morning when you, you know, 10 to 8? And he said, um, no, it's, it's, sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. Um, the, the Tokyo Olympics were on and Dawn Fraser was swimming. And the, um, there was a cop watching the house with, <clears throat> with him because there'd been prowlers and things uh, of them. And he said, and, the, um, and this young constable and I were watching Dawn swim. And what with, you know, the excitement <laughs> by the time we... That, you know, we noticed it was quarter past eight. So I was the only one watching for it, really. Robert, let's talk a bit about the sort of the long-term impact on your life of all of these things. You know, this man, as I've now learned, I didn't really realise, and we've, we've talked about this before, I didn't realise, but was one of Australia's worst ever serial killers. And to think that you knew him, and as you say, you knew one of his victims, and you had involvement with others, you were at a pretty, you know, vulnerable stage in your life. It was 1959 to 1963. You were aged 16 to 20. And I wondered what impact did all of that have on your life? Um, it had a, 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 an impact like it did on the lives of thousands of others, as every, everywhere you go in Perth now, People of my generation and, and even 10 or so years younger have a cook story. Wow. Everyone has a story about um, um, uh, ruses their parents got up to so, you know, they, the houses were double locked or whatever. In fact, Cook made a great fuss of locking his own house up for the, um, so his parents, so his kids would be safe from the murderer. And Sally met <clears throat> mentioned that but um they took their mattresses out on the veranda or something didn't they at one point or there was some story or no they locked they brought the mattresses in from the veranda um uh, and you know, made sure the house was double locked and all that sort of thing in case they and he said that to them didn't he oh yeah he yeah, yeah. Keep yourself he warned the them killer. again he warned them against the killer yeah so it did affect everyone the, uh, the same way so you wrote about this in the shark net which you you published in 2000 had you always planned to write about these these events, and in, in particular that <clears throat> sort of, it, this book's a it's a beautiful memoir of your own life, but it's also um, it's also obviously the chronicle of your experience of living living through this very frightening period in Perth. Is it something that you always planned to write about? No, I didn't always plan to, but in thinking of writing writing my a memoir, um, it was so engrossing. Um, at a key period in my life and a key period in the in the in the state's life, that it was impossible to to not to to not write about it. Um, it it was its effects are still there now, and in the recent cases of the um, the girls that dis started disappearing from a Claremont nightclub, um, and a man and police hunting, who, who they don't know, who, who, they were lost again in trying to work out who'd killed these three young women. Um, it brought back memories to everyone in the state of, an, of a certain age of the Cook years um, because it seemed like the same sort of thing in the same area um, with an unknown unknown uh, perpetrator. You were telling me before a story I'd like you to share. Like you, the, the Shark Net, the book, was made into an ABC, BBC miniseries. And just, just tell us that story about how 
the reception that that got from audiences. Well, it was such a big story over there. Um, anyway, that the TV series did fabulously well. I was delighted to know. And in fact, um, discarding um, people under 12 and in jail and mental homes, uh, everyone else watched it, basically. Mm. Was it uh, four parts, did you say? Yeah. It was a mini series. And William McInnes played your William, dad. William McInnes played, played my father. <clears throat> um, and it had a good cast of, of you know Aussie, Aussie actors and things. Um, and it looked set to break the record of ABC drama, TV drama, the Sunday night 8:30 slot, which used to be the big time for ABC drama. It looked set to break every every record for that. And for the last episode, the electricity grid east of Adelaide, which included Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, went out <laughs> just before it, went, it, was, it was going Is that a coincidence out. or was that because everybody was tuning in to watch it? It brought no, the no, grid no. down. No, it, it went out just before it was about to come on. So um, anyway, that, um, that record remains unbroken. Robert, you said this about the shark net. What I was really impelled to do after all these years was to set down various tumultuous events in order to try to make sense of that period in my life, in my family's life, and the community that I grew up in. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, I can see you getting around to this question, even though I'm loath to talk about it. Um, no, don't talk about anything. No, 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 no. Um, it coincided with, um, while my father, father and I were being fingerprinted and the dramas were going on, my girl, my girlfriend, Getting to that. my girlfriend got got pregnant, and I was eighteen, and she was nineteen. And in the community in which we lived, this was tantamount to some sort of, um, well, well, it was a major episode. And when I told my mother, um, she said, "This will kill me. This will look what you've done. This this will kill me." And I was in a, I was in a fog. She, the, the, my girlfriend was in a fog, um, but we were determined to do the right thing. So it wasn't like a shotgun. Well, if it, if it was a shotgun wedding, we were the ones holding the shotgun, and we we said we'll get. That's what I thought I'd been brought up to do to do the right thing. That, and that was uh, my school motto had been duty, which was only the year before anyway when I left school. Um, so anyway, um, we got married. My mother left the next day to stay with her own mother in Melbourne uh, until the baby was born. Um, and she came home, saw the baby, got a headache and died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, the local doctor, our GP, um, who was a friend of the family and a very GP-ish GP, -ish GP uh, called me in and said, um, in, the, in that friendly avuncular way of, Perth GPs of that era, said, um, I suppose you want to know if you killed your mother. And I could smell, I can still see the surgery, which had a picture, a very gloomy surgery, which smelled of methylated spirits, and there were silver things gleaming everywhere. And a picture on the, wa the wall of Stag at Bay, that lands here, painting, of a step with wolves baying at the, uh, at the stag as he's on the, on the cliff top. And he said, uh, um, I suppose you want to know if you killed your mother. And I looked at him and he said, let's say it was a 60-40 thing. All right. I I'm sorry, I wasn't That's trying right. to get That's to right. that. But right. thank you for sharing that with us. Enough questions from me for now. We've now got time for you guys to ask some questions. If you're asking from the audience here, because of COVID, we're not going to be passing around um, microphones. But if you could just stand up and speak as loudly as you can and then... I will be repeating the questions so that the people who are watching this on Zoom can hear those questions. And if you are on Zoom and you have questions, please send them in. And I think someone's going to write them down and then bring them up to us here. So starting with the live audience, does anyone have any questions? Yes, I'll start with the woman in the purple mask. So the question was, why was he only charged with one murder? And that seems unfair to the families of the other victims. You mightn't be able to answer that, Robert. But He was charged with all of them. He was charged with all of them, but the one that he was sent to trial for was um, was the, was the, the Sturkey one. But there was no doubt if that had failed, he would have been presumably um, they would have brought one of the other ones on. I think probably they looked at them all and thought this is the most clear cut one. Let's eliminate time. And th there was very much a feeling of haste 
we finally got the bugger. Let's get rid of him as, as soon as possible. There was, you know, there's very much a community um, at last, you know, we'll let's deal with this. Yes, down the front, the black mask. Yeah, I'm just black masking myself. I'm just in Thank you. Now. So the question was, did you forensically go over your own encounters with Eric Cook and and think back on those and, and reflect on those and on what happened? And I think you said, did it, I'm sorry, did it challenge your own? Disturb your sense of trust. I yeah, disturb your sense of trust yeah, and, and just the impact on you. Very much because other things happened too. Um, because he worked for my father um, in those days, the the the, the dad, one of Dad's jobs was to go up by coastal steamer all the way up the West Australian coast, selling tyres and tennis rackets and Dunlop golf clubs and all that sort of stuff. So the staff knew when he was away, and twice he prowled our house, and and scared my mother. And fortunately, she'd built up a relationship. Um, with with a, a well the family had with a, a cop one of the cops and she rang the cops and they were there straight away because they were prowling around looking for the 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 murderer and they arrived quickly but um th I mean, there's all sorts of grisly things involved one thing ever since he'd been found um committing arson at 14 he'd realized fingerprints were a giveaway so he wore kid gloves and because of his facial in, um, appearance he wore a, he wore a mask so she heard a noise and went to the went to the window and there's his mask figure with the with with the gloves um but he did that at least twice and then we heard him running down who we now know was him running down the stairs and things but he'd prowled so many houses um he'd prowled the police worked out he'd prowled about 350 houses without the occupants knowing that he had including the premiers then well, how did they Dave find that Brown. out Robert well, they, he confessed to them. I mean, he he was he was quite keen to tell them. Question up the gosh, there's so many questions. All right, I'll start with the one in the back row with the black mask. Yes, you. How was he caught? Sorry, just could you repeat that? Yes. How was he caught, and what was the impact on the community? Well, as I said, he was caught because this, the rifle was found by the couple. Police then watched the rifle for two weeks, um, hidden, you know, they hid away and then jumped on him. Um, and, the, and the relief when he was caught was, was just extraordinary, just extraordinary. Now, these days, of course, one thing about a small community, the newspapers did what the police said. Now, the rifle would have, these days in Sydney, if the rifle had been found, the, the, the story would be the next day, rifle has been found or in the media. Um, and and the, the, the process would be not as efficient, probably. Um, but the police played ball, uh, the, the press played ball. But they didn't report it? No. Oh, so that was why you said you didn't know until that day. No, no, I no. didn't understand that. Okay. No. Another question. Okay, gentleman here in the pale pink or pale red shirt. How, how receptive were Eric's wife, Sally, and children to your approaches to speak to him? Surprisingly, to ve surprisingly very receptive and very, um, she was wonderful. She was a really lovely woman um, who made a cake that when I made the appointment and served me tea in the cake she'd made uh, in her lounge room. Um, and in fact, it was the, the tick tock, tick tock of the clock on the, on the mantelpiece that made me ask her, where, what were you? doing a 10 to 8 on um, such and such and interestingly the cops of the time who were pretty pretty brutal and not the most intelligent um, police around thereafter until she died a year or so ago would call around every Christmas with um, with a couple of bottles of beer and how you, uh, how you how are you going how are you going Sally um, it was you know Everyone, there was some really bad behaviour, but some people, some people surprisingly behaved very well. Uh, yes, here in the front. Um, you next. Your... Question was, was he, did he always wear a mask? Um, he was seen, in the beginning he didn't, and if he, was, if he was planning on killing someone, he didn't bother wearing a mask. But when prowling... Um, later well i know that he wore a mask 
twice at our place. I, I, I don't know whether he, whether he generally did then, but, he's, but he seemed to be aware um, that, he, that his appearance was a giveaway, uh, as, as were his, his fingers, obviously. Right up the back, there's a question. Yeah. So I just need to repeat that. Yeah. So the question was about the role of the press, that at, at first the gay divorcee was that, sorry, the no. naked divorcee was, uh, that was how the first murder victim was described in a sensationalist way. And then you made the point that later on, Robert has said that the press played ball with the police. And the question was, what was the role of the police? How did they behave, uh, the press, how did they behave at that time? Well, well there were, I'm talking about two sections of the press. The, 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 um, um, di naked divorcee was then the Sunday Times and the and the Mirror, which were tabloid um, crappy papers, and the West Australian um, in those days was very straight, very conservative, and would wouldn't make, didn't make anything of the. Um, I don't think they used the word naked and uh, that sort of thing. So it was there's a demarcation between the two. Yes, here at the front. So I'm going to stop for a moment just to bring Pete in case people at home can't hear this. So this um, woman is saying that she lived in the house of one of the victims. She didn't know it at the time. No, I, and she actually slept in the bedroom that Constance was sleeping in. And you found out later that that yeah. is that one that was murdered in. Yes, which is obviously. But sorry, again, I'm just going to bring people up. So you were 19 to 20 when you lived there. You said the house had a sense of feeling haunted. haunted. You weren't yeah. told about what had happened there and the rent was low. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm also. <laughs> You're a writer. I'm a and um, I'd been writing about West Australian true crime. I'd even been referencing Eric and Cook. No. Yeah. And okay, been... sorry, more. So <laughs> she, this is a story in itself. This, this woman is a crime writer. She'd been writing about Eric Cook. And then how did you find out? So someone sent me a copy of the City Echo Post and it says State Buys Murder House. And it was the picture of the Thomas Street house. And I just was like, what the hell? And I've been having dreams about that house. I just had these kind of very abstract nightmares. And um, yeah, just had no idea. But so it was that after you'd moved out, you found oh, out. Okay, so after she'd moved out, she saw in, this, the, in the newspaper a picture of the house. It was called State Sells the Crime House. Yeah, so and you'd wondered why you'd always had such an uncomfortable feeling living there. Yeah, and a Burmese cat had come into our house, and so this victim had a Siamese cat <gasps> who had apparently scratched Eric and Cook. Um, Sorry, I, you've got, all got to hear this. So then a Burmese cat had come into, the, into your house when you were living there, and at the time of the murders, the victim had a Siamese cat which had scratched <laughs> Eric Cook. This just gets better by the minute. More, okay, more. Yeah, no. <laughs> And one of the people who was living in the room that had the bad vibes had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. Okay. Is there a question or are you just, thank you for sharing. No, thank you for sharing that with us. But I, yeah, then I just, I, what, what was really yes. interesting was because he eventually confessed to that. That's what I'm told. And he actually sexually assaulted the victim. We might stop there. I, I remember that story and we are, we are short of time. Okay, but sure. thank you for sharing that. Cyber, crime writer. Yep. And has been running a sex. Wow. Okay, so everybody, this is Ruth McIver, who's a crime writer. Who's sorry, I thought you were putting me to the five minute sign, Sue, saying, "I apologise, Ruth. I didn't mean to cut you off. I know that story, and I don't think we'll talk about that one. But thank you so much for sharing. That's an amazing. You need to talk to Robert afterwards. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with us. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, near the back. Were all the killings random or did it come out at the trial that there were particular reasons for killing those victims? They were all, they were all completely random and they are all strangers. There was no connection between any of them. Even ones in the case of <clears throat> uh, John Sturkey and Wamsley, who lived a block away, didn't, one was a, a teenager, one was 56. No, no one knew each other. Yeah, so was there any um, evidence, I guess, about the mental state of the murderer? Did he have a mental illness? There could have been if he'd been allowed to have his own psychiatric assessment, um, which I would have thought would have been a prerequisite, um, and not be given the government um, psychiatrist who was working very earnestly for the other side. Catherine, you have a question. 
So sorry. Um, yeah. Catherine's question. This is Catherine, the director of this fantastic festival, asking this question. So did Perth revert to the innocence of its earlier days or was it forever changed as a result of these murders? It was forever changed even um, architecturally uh, in that prior to that, um, there was a, a Perth habit of not having front fences and growing your lawn right to the road so the verge became yours. And there's a, a Perth habit of the Sunday drive where people would drive up and down admiring um, other people's verges and houses and frontages and so forth, um, while people hid behind Venetians watching <laughs> the cars go past. Um, but after that, every, everyone built high uh, limestone fences. Over, overnight, um, they, they built um, like six foot high limestone fences. All, all over, all over the, the the western suburbs, which there is the the eastern suburbs here or the North Shore here. I'm sorry, we don't have time for any more more questions. Please, would you join me in thanking our wonderful guest Robert Drew for sharing these stories today? Good news for all of you is that Robert will be available to sign copies of his books and I'm sure answer questions maybe uh, opposite the library bookshop, which is just outside the cafe. Please could you leave this room at the end of the session, even if you're in here for the next one. And please enjoy the rest of this fantastic festival. Tickets for other events are for sale at the festival reception table opposite the library cafe. Thank you so much.